Thank you for having us and for looking forward to a fruitful discussion. It is known that in the early 19th century, in Constantinople, the free teachers were protagonists of a musical reformation of Byzantine music. A new notational system called the New Method was established through which the intervals of the melodies and the time expressed in beats were well defined. And this is the fact. In contrast, 19th century chanters observed that the old notation score had melody parts that were not written down since they sang more notes than the ones indicated by the interval signs, and this is, of course, the observation. In addition, they believed that the hymns were always chanted in the same way, and that is the belief. The new method of reformation was closely connected to the process of exegesis, which literally means interpretation. Through this process, an interpreter, an exegetist, using the new notational system, wrote down the way in which the chanters of his era used to perform compositions located in the old system. The belief of the invariableness of the Byzantine melodies is clearly expressed in Chrysanthos theoretical treatise, while Constantinos Psachos and later Gregorio Stavis developed and transformed this idea into a scientific position. According to these scholars, exegesis was diachronically a process of transcribing a single invariable melody in a more analytical way. Hence, according to this position, the great doxologies composed before or during the 18th century, among other compositions, would have been diachronically sung in the very same way until the 19th century, when they were transcribed into the new method. Instead, we observe that the two doxologies, written down in the middle of the 18th century, using Barthes notation coming from the Sinai 1477, so remarked differences when compared to their exegesis by Chromosius in the early 19th century. Furthermore, even different exegesis of the same doxologies transcribed by different exegetes into the new method show notable differences, in particular regarding the time duration of syllables. In our research, we attempt to thoroughly examine these observations in order to interpret the ambiguity of the old method in the early 19th century, while our ultimate goal is to study the development of how the engraved doxologies were sung from the 18th to the 19th century. We took our sample for a corpus consisted of the great doxologies transcribed into either the new method or part notation. In particular, we examined the doxology of Yemalos in the first triangle modes, Palacis in Caspian doxologies, one fourth mode and the other various modes, and Bereketz from first mode. All of this from the 19th century exegesis. And also the doxologies of Melchizedek and Panagiotis Hexapis from the 18th century transcriptions, which we compare to their exegesis from the 19th century. Embarking on our research, the first question we had to deal with was whether or not the exegetes had used different forlag. Forlag is a technical term which refers to the original manuscript on which the scriber based his copy. In that scenario, maybe a different compositional version was transcribed into the new method from a different version of the original composition written in the old method. In order to examine the validity of this conjecture, we checked at least 10 manuscripts of which <coughs> of the six doxologies. We observed that all the copies of each particular doxology are almost identical regarding the melodic line, known as metrophonia. There is some scattered differences as far as some subsidiary signs are concerned. For example, piasma, apodoma, bourbon, etc. At this point, we were able to surmise that the differences were not due to the work done 
by the original transcribers. Of course, the entire subject needs further and more systematic research. Having made this assumption, we were able to continue examining firstly the 19th century antiquity and secondly the 18th century sources versus the 19th century exegesis. When we look exclusively at the exegesis of the 19th century, at first glance we observe differences in the exegesis where extra melismas are added and where pneumatization was started. There are also differences concerning the distribution of the bits per syllabus. Returning to the question concerning the extra melismata, we juxtapose the composition written using the old method with the exegesis of the new method. In some places, we see that exegetes from Athos add melismata at the end of phrases without any notational indication to suggest this. What is even more striking is that when the Hearitus, who does add extra melismata at the end of some phrases, uses the old method, the manuscript does not include the extra melismata. As we see here, the first part is from the old manuscript from the Chiariti. And the exegesis of the Chiariti is and big man is Matrian. So we can see clearly that we are not dealing with four lines. A further observation is that Athonites often use melismata, which are used in other parts of the same composition as extra melismata. Now we are going to look at the differences we noted at the points where pneumatization starts. In order to deal with this, we split the doxologies into phrases. We then took each phrase of each doxology and compared them. The comparisons were made two at a time. We thus found the number of times that the starting points of pneumatization coincided. Here, we have highlighted the comparisons that showed a percentage of coincidence lower than 7%. If we look at Grigoris and Murmuzios, exegesis of Balassi's various doxology, and remember, Grigoris and Murmuzios are two of the three teachers who started the Reformation, of 1814, we see 40.1% coincidence. The deviation between the various exegesis suggests that there is no exact indication in the old notation for starting pneumatization. The third question concerns the exegesis texture of the doxologies. In order to answer this, we have to first ex express the exegesis of the doxologies in a quantitative way. Thus, we identified each syllable of each exegesis with the number of its corresponding bits. We then excluded the final syllable of each phrase of all the exegesis. <coughs> this was necessary firstly to be able to examine the exegesis without the extra melismata, and secondly because we take for granted a conventional psaltic performance that considers final syllable of each phrase having weaker systemic value in the compositional texture in comparison to the rest of the phrase. We then did hypothesis testing, ANOVA for three different exegesis and PIT test for two exegesis in order to examine the similarity of the exegesis texture between the doxologies. The results were not statistically significant. We then counted the similarities by simply writing a Python code which compared and counted the number of bits in the corresponding syllabus of exegesis of each doxology. As you can see, the percentage of similarity shown is over 7% in all cases. This means that more or less the exigites, when interpreting old method, appear to keep in average 2 bits per syllable. <laughs> Looking then at the 18th century, we repeated the whole process but only selected the doxologies for which we have transcription from the 18th century and exegesis from the 19th century. The initial observations were the same. In all other words, again, we have extra melismata, different pneumatizing points, and a different distribution of the bits per syllable. It should be further noted that there are some phrases in the 18th century transcription which are purely syllabic. We see that the concept of extra melismata can be seen exclusively in the 18th century transcription of the Melchizedek doxology. We see the notation 
century are the text Melisma. And furthermore, it is possible to find these extra Melisma that are written elsewhere in the original Old Method manuscript. As far as the second question is concerned, we will examine the interchangeability of the 18th century transcription, which use both the syllabic and the pneumatic style. On the one hand, we have Promusius exegesis where we see that all the phrases are pneumatic. On the other, the transcriber of the Sinai Codex uses uh, phrases which are purely syllabic. Wishing to share this with you, we come to the number of phrases which are purely syllabic in the transcriptions of Melchizedek and Presaphix doxologies. In the former, a quarter of the phrases are purely syllabic, and in the latter, 13.3%. Here we present the third verse of the Sinai transcription of Melchizedek's doxology. The green highlighted frames indicate the pneumatic parts of the verse, while the red ones indicate the syllabic parts. For our convenience, we just oppose the old method version with an adoption of the Sinai version into the new method. Again, this is the old method, and the, method, the new method adoption from the Sinai transcription. The absence of systematicity concerning the interchangeability between the two styles suggests that there is no exact indication in the old notation for the one or the other choice. Going on to the third question, we examine the differences we noted at the points where pneumatization started, similar to the methodology we used from the 19th century doxologies. The deviation, again, suggests the absence of any indication in the old notation for starting pneumatization. The fourth question concerns the texture of the doxologies for which we use again the same methodology. As you can see on this frequencies bar chart of Melchizedek's uh, doxology, Sinai transcriber spends much more often 1 or 0.5 bits per syllable in contrast to Hormuzios who prefers to spend 2 or 4 bits per syllable. According to this hypothesis testing, the two different versions of the doxologies are considered non-similar. Specifically, the probability the Sinai transcription to be similar to Hormuzios exegesis is less than 0.001. Chrysabis doxology presents exactly the same results. Mm. Counting now the similarities between the two versions of the doxologies, we found deviation that overcome 60% at the first and 55% at the second case. Combining the previous statistical results, we come to the general idea of a mixed syllable pneumatic texture of 18th century doxology. <laughs> <laughs> to sum up, based on our qualitative analysis of our purposeful sum, we came to the following conclusions. First, there is no indication for pneumatization in the old method. Second, moving from the 18th to the 19th century, we observe a development from a mixed syllable pneumatic to a mainly pneumatic style regarding the way of chanting doxologies based on the same old method score. Third, in our analysis of the various versions of the doxologies, we spot three different features, the flexibility of which determines the whole temperament of each version. These are A. The interchangeability between syllabic and pneumatic approach. B. 
the spontaneous addition of extra melismata at the end of some phrases and see the choice of the point where pneumatization starts. 18th century chanters seem to be flexible in all features. 19th century exigites coming from Athos follow this tradition except for interchangeability. While Gregorius and Cormusius try to be more systematic in their interpretation of the old method are only flexible regarding the starting point of pneumatization. Last but not least, it can be reasonably assumed that semantic shifting of the term exegesis occurred. For Sinai transcriber, exegesis seems to mean a kind of musical elaboration of the indicated by the old notation melody. This elaboration includes partial pneumatizations and addition of extra melismata at the end of some verses. 19th century exegetes from Athos seem to maintain the old concept, being more intent on a mainly pneumatic temperament. In contrast, Gregorius and Cormusius consider exegesis as a process which exclusively has to do with the transcription of a more synoptic to a more analytical notation, while the very melody remains unchangeable. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.